Return to the Cave of Letters was made possible with major support from the Gilbert M. and Martha H. Hitchcock Foundation, the Bethsaida Excavations Project at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford. The Judean Desert, harsh, unforgiving. In the second century AD, deep within desert caves, a small band of Jews sought refuge. The men, women, and children hid here, hoping to escape Rome's attempt to decimate their rebellion and destroy their way of life. They were followers of Bar Kokhba, the man some believed was the Messiah. The idea that he was the Messiah, the chosen one, at last, would of course electrify his followers. Above the caves hid the Roman army, waiting for the rebels' food and water to run out. Nearly 2,000 years later, scientists discovered the remains of the Bar Kokhba faithful in several caves. Discoveries in one particular cave breathe life into the final chapter of the history of ancient Israel. We were stunned. We couldn't, we just couldn't believe it. All that, all that writing, suddenly the papyrus and the, and the pieces of wood. From then on, this became the Cave of Letters, a silent shrine to a failed rebellion. Today, scientists and scholars are returning to the cave. A worker from a previous expedition insisted there was more to be found. Under the rubble, he saw, but couldn't reach, what he thought were the skeletal remains of a man. And this is what he said. He used the word, I believe. I believe that the remains that were in there were from the temple in Jerusalem, and this man was one of the temple priests. This account and an artifact from another archaeological dig led to a theory. Perhaps treasures rescued from the temple in Jerusalem decades before the Bar Kokhba revolt lay buried beneath boulders. But this foray into the desert brings more than intellectual curiosity to the renowned cave. These scientists and scholars came bearing new technology, technology that might solve more ancient mysteries in the return to the Cave of Letters. Jerusalem on a hot summer day. Two years of preparation lead up to this moment. Everything falls into place for a momentous archaeological adventure into one of the most famous caves in Jewish history. The trip is the brainchild of Dr. Richard Freund. The University of Hartford professor oversees an interdisciplinary group to examine the cave, inside and out. An open-air bus carries the researchers and their precious technological cargo on a bone-jarring two-hour ride. They head southeast from Jerusalem. The Cave of Letters is located near the Dead Sea, about halfway down the west shoreline. It's hidden in the wall of one of the Judean desert's many canyons, called Wadis. The desert's extreme conditions are challenge enough, but the cave's entrance, 600 feet above the canyon floor, makes getting there a dangerous endeavor. Harry Joel of the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire is a pivotal player. His expertise with ground-penetrating radar, or GPR, is a key to whether or not this expedition succeeds. GPR is used increasingly in archaeology, but rarely in caves, and many experts doubt it will work in the Cave of Letters. Joel hopes to prove them wrong. Geologist Jack Schroeder comes from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. A climber who earned his stripes in the Himalayas, Dr. Schroeder's charge is to investigate the geological history of the cave. 
Philip Reeder is an Omaha colleague of Schroeder's. Dr. Reeder, an expert at mapping caves, plans to survey the Cave of Letters and create more accurate mapping. Fred Strickert, a Wartburg College religious studies professor, is the crew's expert on ancient coins. Previous expeditions uncovered coins, but Dr. Strickert hopes to find more. More sums up the goal of this trip. More artifacts. More facts about a so-called Messiah who would forever change the course of Jewish history. And more proof that the latest technology can open new doors for archaeologists. Others from the team will join forces with them at the desert base camp, including Freund's partner, archaeologist Rami Arav. Dr. Arav first teamed up with Freund in the early 1990s, enlisting his help in the excavation of Israel's lost city of Bethsaida. Bethsaida was uncovered beside what had been the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Many historians believe the ancient fishing village was home to at least three of Jesus Christ's apostles before he charged them to become fishers of men. Workers have unearthed many structures and artifacts at Bethsaida. One in particular led Freund and Arav ultimately to the Cave of Letters. It was an incense shovel that appeared to be from a Roman imperial cult temple of the first century. It turns out the shovel was nearly identical to one found by famed Israeli archaeologist Yigal Yadin four decades earlier in the Cave of Letters. Yadin, however, assumed his find was from the second century. Those two shovels from those two places set a pair of minds in motion. It was that moment when we, we took a, an artifact that was found at Bethsaida and understood that it had been found at another location, or a similar artifact had been found at another location, a parallel artifact, where we started to put the two histories together. Uh, Yadin thought about it as to be a uh, second century. And Yadin thought that it's coming most probably from a Roman, uh, Roman military camp. And I remember saying, but ours is from the first century. Is it possible that Yadin made the mistake of assigning his shovel to the second century? Dr. Arav felt if their shovel was a ritual item of the Roman imperial cult, why couldn't the same be true for the one from the Cave of Letters? Where a Roman imperial cult center was uh, in the neighborhood of the Cave of Letters. The closest that I know about was the temple that Hadrian built on the compound on the top of the ruined temple. Um, of Israel in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And so uh, I spent uh, literally uh, a thousand hours researching every single one of the incense shovels until I came up with my own theory. And the theory is that the incense shovel that was discovered in the Cave of Letters probably came from the Temple in Jerusalem. Theories about the shovels first propel this expedition. But what drives the crew to its destination is the quest for new insight into a tragic era of Jewish history. After decades of oppression and taxation, Jewish zealots launched what is known as the First Revolt in 66 AD. In the year 70, the Roman army retaliated by destroying the heart of the Jewish religion and culture, the temple in Jerusalem. Rome tightened its grip on their capital, desecrated their temple, and made off with their wealth. The Jews had stored their religious icons and personal valuables in the temple in the form of thousands of ritual items and tons of precious metals. It's believed that at least the larger items were taken back to Rome, trophies of the physical and spiritual pillage of Judaism. That rebellion ended three years later. The Jews were defeated. Nearly 2,000 years later, 
A discovery in the desert would lead to new speculation on the missing treasure. After 60 years of relative calm, the Roman Emperor Hadrian fanned the flames of rebellion. Hadrian banned many Jewish practices, including circumcision, and in a supreme display of contempt for Judaism, he ordered construction of a shrine to the Roman god Jupiter where the Jewish temple once stood. Enter Bar Kokhba, son of a star. The Jews had been looking for a messianic figure, so when a leading rabbi proclaimed him King Messiah, many thought their prayers had been answered. The Jews had their leader, and in the year 132 AD, the second revolt to retake Judea began. Very likely he was a charismatic leader, a magnetic leader, because of the way people followed him and did painful and difficult physical things for him, what he commanded. But in addition, the idea that he was the Messiah, the chosen one, at last, would of course electrify his followers. The rebels did not try to risk open confrontation against the Romans, but occupied the advantageous positions in the country and strengthened them with mines and walls so that they would have places of refuge when hard-pressed and could communicate with one another underground. Dio Cassius, 3rd century historian. The Herodium was one of those places. King Herod built the fortress on a hill more than a century before. During the Second Revolt, Bar Kokhba rebels lived in the tunnels. They used the Herodium as a regional capital, treasury, and base for their guerrilla warfare tactics. Rome felt threatened, and Hadrian dispatched the famous general Julius Severus all the way from Britain. The subject for Rome was not simply a rebellion, on, in the hinterland of the empire. The subject was if one group gets away with it, others will get ideas. And Rome couldn't possibly hold the whole empire if, if it would go up in rebellion all over the place. But one by one, Julius Severus and his legions chopped away at the rebel strongholds and the Jewish quest for independence. Fifty of their most important outposts and 85 of their most famous villages were razed to the ground. 580,000 were slain in the various raids and battles. Thus, nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate. Dio Cassius, 3rd century historian. Bar Kokhba was slain at his fortress in Betar as the rebellion drew to a close. The failure of the Bar Kokhba revolt brought Roman reprisal that put an end to the Jewish state for almost 2,000 years. But deep in caverns in the walls of Judean desert canyons burned the last embers of revolt. A group of rebels, some with wives and children, fled to those caves. Roman legions camped above the caves, atop the canyon, to prevent the rebels' escape. Emperor Hadrian wanted the Jews' fire for freedom completely extinguished. With limited food and water, it was only a matter of time for the rebels. Nearly 2,000 years would pass before the Cave of Letters would give up its secrets about the revolt and the rebels who hid there. Wherever they're setting up is where the camp has to be. In the heat of the pounding sun, the Judean desert is a harsh place. Atop the canyon, first order of business is to create some shade. Working in the searing sun is no place for man or beast. And the upcoming descent down the side of the canyon to the Cave of Letters is no place for untrained explorers. Ew. You do two, and that'll be the end of it. All right, because you're trusting your life to this, we ask that you bring it back once. Okay, so make it three. Okay, 
This will never open. Chagai Rosenblue is a professional guide hired to escort the expedition to the cave. Rosenblue's biggest responsibility is to make certain the equipment is in place for getting down the side of the cliff, then up a 30-foot ladder to the cave. It's safe, it's stable, it's tied up, it rocks a bit. So, um, especially in the beginning... With improved climbing methods, this venture is much safer than half a century ago, when the rush to the desert began. In 1947, a shepherd boy found the first of a horde of scrolls hidden in the caves near the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls are still considered one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. They comprise the oldest group of biblical manuscripts ever found. But with news of the first finds, a frantic race began between Bedouins and archaeologists. That race lasted nearly a decade. The urgency was this. Uh, two things, really. One would be to find things in archaeological context, so we could date them, we know where they are, find all the finds together. Uh, rather than, say, on the antiquities market. The other interest, of course, for the state of Israel was that these things of priceless Jewish heritage come into the hands of the state of Israel and into Jewish hands and be understood and made public to the world, but through uh, the Jewish state, uh, whose heritage they were. Explorations in the Dead Sea region also turned up a mysterious copper scroll. Its enigmatic etchings led some to believe the treasure from the temple in Jerusalem had been whisked away before Rome's domination of Jerusalem and hidden in the desert caves. Hurriedly etched on copper, the scroll appeared to inventory vast amounts of temple treasure. Many scholars consider it the work of an active imagination. And despite numerous repetitions and contradictions in the text, it continues to intrigue scholars. Dr. Freund is one of them. He cites one particular section. In the cave of the column of two openings which face to the east, in the northern opening buried three cubits, there is a basket. The cave of the column, Dr. Freund speculates, may actually refer to the cave of letters, as there are very few two opening caves in the Dead Sea area. Things heated up in the desert antiquity scramble in 1952. Bedouins had found two more papyrus scraps. They were reportedly scraps of letters from Bar Kokhba, that mythic leader of the Second Jewish Revolt. So the focus of the hunt shifted. The area around the ancient settlement of Qumran was the desert repository of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but new finds came from south of there, from canyon caves around En Gedi. The inspector of the Israeli Department of Antiquities, Yohanan Aharoni, quickly organized his country's first effort on this front. In a short time, Aharoni and his team discovered evidence of Bar Kokhba's ill-fated revolt. On opposite sides of a canyon leading to the Dead Sea, he observed what appeared to be the remains of two Roman siege camps. Aharoni figured the caves below the Roman camps offered the best chance of success. His theory was sound, but his first survey failed to turn up a trace of the rebels or definitive documents regarding Bar Kokhba. What he did find in a huge cave that would later be renowned as the Cave of Letters, Baruch Safrai would never forget. <laughs> Once I entered with my flashlight, I suddenly saw a piece of fabric. I looked around and saw that there were some bones lower on the bottom of the cave and the belt with a knot. I was deeply thrilled. I understood that there is a man lying down there, a skeleton as a matter of fact. And I believe, and this is what he said, he used the word I believe, I believe that there is a first century layer and that the, this was, the cave of letters, was not only used for second century remains, but it was used for first century remains. And the remains that were in there were from the temple in Jerusalem, and this man was one of the temple priests.
Were the mysterious remains really those of a temple priest? If so, did he flee to the cave to spear it away and safeguard the temple treasures? Could the cave of letters have become a desert vault? When Aharoni returned to the Nahal Hever two years later, human remains were actually recovered. In a different cave lay scores of skeletons. Photographer Baino Rottenberg was there in what was immediately dubbed the Cave of Horrors. You could see that these are the last moments of families, children. And of course, the most exciting, almost what really gripped me was the hand of a little baby or a little child, you know, like this. That was a terrible picture. More horrific images of the rebels' demise and some inspiring discoveries would have to wait until the next decade. In 1960, Joseph Aviram headed up a new round of excavations in response to a new flurry of finds. Aharoni and three other archaeologists join Aviram. Yegel Yadin was one of them. He had low expectations of finding much in his assigned area, the Nahal Hever area. Aharoni had already searched there. But like Aharoni before him, Yadin decided the caves below the Roman camps would most likely produce something from the Bar Kokhba era. He liked the odds of one particular cave on the northern side of the canyon, even though Aharoni found evidence that the Bedouins had already looted there. It was a cave of bats. It was uh, uh, piles and piles of bat dung and uh, dust. And uh, of course, uh, we didn't have electricity. Pinhas Porat was a volunteer with Yadin's group. He would play a major role in this round of excavations. The first discovery was a basket of skulls. Additional proof of the tragic end for Bar Kokhba's holdouts here. A find at the end of this trip would nearly mirror it. Workers found a few skeletons and more skulls. Otherwise, it seemed Yadin's part in this massive expedition would yield little more than pot shards. Then, workers discovered a Bar Kokhba coin outside the cave. In planning his revolt, Bar Kokhba realized how important it was to rally the support of the people around him. And by, by issuing coins, what he was doing was declaring, in a sense, nationhood. The Bar Kokhba coins were minted in each of the revolt's three years to finance the rebellion. Restoration of the temple was a major theme. Various other symbols indicate a return to temple ritual and independence. And then along with this religious symbolism, you had the name of, uh, of Bar Kokhba. Actually, then it was just simply Shimon, and on some of them, Hanasi, the, the prince. Uh, this was a political term uh, declaring that, that he, in fact, was the president of this nation. They were that confident. Finding one of those coins here was thrilling. In hopes of finding more, an army official suggested using mine detectors. We kept on digging, and it kept on buzzing very loud, very uh, uh, stridently. And finally, we found a piece of rope. We followed the rope, which tied the handle of a basket. We uh, dug around. We removed the basket. We untied the rope that tied the basket, and of course, the hoard of uh, bronze utensils fell out. There were 19 utensils in all, a libation vessel, bowls, jugs, and three incense shovels. Later, many of these utensils would enlighten scholars on the religious way of life for the rebels who sought shelter here. But the stellar achievement of Yadin's excavation 
was the kind of material all of Israel had been hoping for. A packet was found beneath what appeared to be a woman's purse. We were stunned. We couldn't, we just couldn't believe it. All that, all that writing, suddenly the papyrus and the, and the pieces of wood. The bundle of documents turned out to be letters to two rebel commanders at Engedi. The letters were from Bar Kokhba. In one, he even calls himself President over Israel. Most of the military orders contain admonitions of reprisals written at the end of the revolt. Later, Yadin himself would declare this find retrieval of part of the nation's lost history. One year later, in 1961, a final visit for Yigal Yadin to what was now officially dubbed the Cave of Letters. It must have seemed like an anticlimax, but on the first day back in the cave, another basket was pulled from beneath boulders. In all their excitement to view its contents, the crew would have to wait. The photographer who would document opening this find was in the Cave of Horrors, some distance away. I suggested that uh, I'll be coming late in the evening, but uh, photography will be done. Uh, Yadin decided the next morning. Of course, we didn't sleep the whole night. It was uh, because there was a, a feeling that something, something great is going to be found. Finally, the contents of the discovery were revealed. One by one, Yadin released them from their ancient hideaway. The array was fascinating. A woman's mirror, a jewelry box, sandals, and keys. House keys, gate keys, the people who hid here and likely died here had planned to return to their homes. At the last moment, uh, Yadin had a big, uh, it was a big uh, leather, uh, probably for water container, leather container, and uh, he was 100% wanted to be sure. He pulled his hand inside, and here came out a bundle of letters. The bundle at first appeared inauspicious, but inside it, a world of knowledge. The bundle belonged to a woman named Bapta. So she had all of her own personal material. She had de title deeds. She had wills. She had all sorts of uh, bills of sale, all sorts of doc personal documents, together with the letters her husband had received uh, from uh, the military commander Bar Kokhba. Many of the documents came from the ancient city of Petra, just one of Baptist stops in a busy and prosperous life, a life of three husbands. Even so, most of Baptist's personal stories and those of other Jews were lost with the ravages of time. But the 35 documents of this extraordinary record keeper, retrieved nearly 2,000 years later, projected an incredible light on Jewish life under Roman rule. And it's not just we didn't have much about women in the second century, for Jewish, say, Jewish culture in the second century, we didn't have much at all, like almost nothing at all from that period. And so uh, it's our major source for second century. Yigal Yadin's two phenomenal expeditions seemed to close the book on the Cave of Letters. So why, nearly four decades later, would a band of scholarly speculators hope to journey back to the cave and into time? New ideas, new approaches, and new technology. Time to unwind in the desert. It's a jarring transition from the comforts of Jerusalem to the crushing heat of the Judean desert. This interdisciplinary team makes final preparations for its visit to the Cave of Letters. Responsibility for this historic venture weighs heavily on the primary players. 
Yigal Yadin's diaries of his expeditions here receive a final going over. Then it's time to eat. The team's first desert dinner. It's fresh bread, so you better have it today, otherwise... You Just getting here is a major accomplishment, but nightfall brings that part of the journey to a close. Morning would usher in the real test of their talent and technology. Yadin was larger than life. Somehow he managed to get himself in the cave. The Barkakba people were larger than life. They live there. What about us? Were we, were we going to be able to make it uh, along the trail and then to the ladder and up in the cave and then were we able to carry out what we were expecting to do? Grab the flag and dive through the To fulfill their mission, crew members carry hundreds of pounds of equipment on their backs and up into the cave. Even without the gear, fear of plunging down hundreds of feet from narrow ledges is inescapable. It's an immense landscape. I mean, you're in a, a canyon that is uh, over a thousand feet deep probably, and uh, there you are on the side of it, and yeah, you're just a little speck. And the visit to this immense landscape comes with stringent environmental restrictions. The entire Judean desert is considered a national treasure, and so are its regular inhabitants. Eagles, vultures, and certain other species are protected by the Israeli Nature Preserve along an ecologically sensitive corridor between Asia and Africa. The preserve strictly limits access to and activities around the caves much of the year. And going down to the cave, we couldn't talk, which means you can't signal anybody. You couldn't uh, uh, tell people to go slower or fast. You had to be quiet so as not to disturb the fledgling birds. So in, from an environmental point of view, we were very careful. They, they told us we either had to be careful or we couldn't work in the cave. These archaeologists, historians, geologists have read everything they could about the Cave of Letters, its history, its excavations. But no scholarly research could prepare them for the rush of feeling as they finally crawl through the threshold. It's as if time is frozen here. The last minute, the last stand in its, in the, in the last minute. And this, it's absolutely wonderful. It's like you leap over 2,000 years almost. And you see things like uh, you go back in time, like when you enter this cave and you crawl, you crawl in kind of a cave of time. A cave that takes these searchers back to a moment in history when the runaway rebels occupied this isolated chamber. But even that is part of a bigger story, the tragedy of the Jewish people uh, who were kicked out of their country as a result of the Jewish revolt, their uh, sacred capital destroyed and so on. And so the cave, I had a strong sense that the cave is a little microcosm of a very large and dramatic and tragic story. To glean new perspective on that tragic story, the crew burrows through narrow tunnels. This is not a find and grab mission. It's a holistic approach to the cave. By learning more about it, researchers hope to uncover more than just Bar Kokhba era revelations. It is possible that the cave history of mankind in this cave uh, started out um, uh, in the Calculitic period in the uh, fourth millennium BC. And, uh, and then we have perhaps another layer in the um, first revolt and the second revolt and maybe something in between. And into this history of the geology of the cave, we can fit in uh, the history of um, human being or, or mankind. Yigal Yadin's map shows three cavernous halls, A, B, and C. Yadin discovered his treasures around the edges and only in halls A and C. 
Dr. Freund found it hard to believe there was nothing to be found in Hall B. We have, we're just doing B. We just want to do B? We, we have to just stay with okay. and be experts in B. If not, we're not going to be experts in anything. Right now, he's going to run a line right along the, the side of the... That was part of the pitch to the Antiquities Authority of Israel. To get their excavation license, doctors Freund and Arav promised to experiment in just one part of the cave. They also touted a new technologically advanced concept that would preserve the cave's integrity. Freund and Arav dubbed their technique non-invasive excavation. What we would like to do is the following. We'd like to bring in ground penetrating radar. We'd like to look under the rocks. We'd like to then use an endoscope to see what is below those areas that we identify as possibly containing finds or pockets where um, uh, habitation took place. And then once we know that there is something there, photograph those things and not necessarily try to excavate the entire cave. The Antiquities Authority gave the team only five days to accomplish all they had set out to do, studying the cave inside and out. Geologist Schroeder loses no time in getting samples. To understand the history of the cave, Schroeder takes a look way back. Long after the cave was formed by water and the canyon was created by more water, Layers of microscopic life found a home in these formations. Much later, human life sought refuge here. Each layer of life was likely separated by roof fall from earthquakes, creating geological chapters of human history. Some of those earthquakes were actually noted in ancient writings, giving archaeologists a way to line up historical events with the layers. And because dating techniques have improved since the time of Yadin, there is a way to learn more. I think that this roof fall came down on top of uh, material uh, from the Bar Chokba people uh, or older people than that, and that it came down somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 1,500 years ago and covered this area up. And so we expect that down underneath here, uh, we're going to find remains that we're very interested in. The earthquake debris in this hall, while illuminating, could keep the team from finding the secrets of this archaeological icon. Moving the boulders, except for the very smallest ones, seems not only impossible, but it could easily destroy the history that lies beneath them. Even Yadin felt stonewalled by the rocks. When you read the literature, you find that uh, uh, they could not really excavate in this hall because there was too much debris on the floor, and there was no way to break up the debris. Break up the debris? Not an option. Get around it? In some cases. Make sense of it. That's where GPR comes in, the ground penetrating radar. Harry Joel of the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire has been working with GPR for more than a decade. This, this machine is going to help us to do what here well, in the cave? What we're looking at is uh, using the FM radio waves. Mm -hmm. as we go FM down, radio waves at different frequencies. They first test to see which frequencies would provide the most useful information about the debris and how it's layered. What we'll do is we're going to put the antennae side by side, about half a meter, uh, half a meter apart. Two paddles simultaneously transmit radio signals down into the cave. 14 and 12. Antennae on the paddles receive the signals that bounce back from the hidden surfaces. The paddles are moved outward, sending out and receiving back signals at specific intervals. It's a tedious and backbending process they repeat until Hall B is completely scanned. And, and you're concerned about not being exact. What you have to do is compare this cave to being on a flat road. Mm -hmm. Flat road, you can get you know, a lot more precise here. We've got to do the best job we can trying to find out. You know, you have rocks all over the place, big boulders. So, Use of ground-penetrating radar in archaeology is relatively recent. Okay. Newer yet, um, and developing constantly, is the computer's ability to illustrate GPR results. Uh, this is going across that way again. Joel's laptop is a data bank for the information the radar sends back. 
he studies the screen to look for roof fall pockets that are possibly penetrable. We chose six or seven sites and the metal detector went to those sites and out of those six or seven sites we chose two sites to take a look at in more detail. So the ground penetrating radar does indicate those areas where we want to be more detailed. A crew member waves the metal detector around. One hope is to find Bar Kokhba coins. There have been over 6,000 that have been found, but only one coin has ever actually been found here in the Cave of Letters. Yadin had mine detectors, which were very primitive, and he was only able to find one coin. A Bar Kokhba coin is discovered on this trip. They also find a Roman coin minted in Arabia a couple of decades before Bar Kokhba's revolt. The metal detector leads to both. Results from the GPR also indicate a hopeful area below the top layer of roof fall. A test excavation begins. It is an arduous process. The boulders remain the barrier, but their effort bears fruit. I don't know. Check it out, please. Uh, Richard, I would, I would suggest here. a green light. Yeah. yeah, see right here. Yeah. I would suggest a green light. Let me work carefully in there mm -hmm. and see what we bring out. What do you see over here in the corner? Gordon. It looks very promising for more of the same. Soon the team is reasonably sure that this was a hearth area where the Bar Kokhba refugees cooked their meals. Oh, thank you, Richard. Okay. Um, Richard, did you notice? Kristen. Phil notice all the charcoal marks? Yeah. Thank you, Richard. That might be the, uh, where they... The crew follows up other radar leads and quickly learns more about the people who once lived here. It looks so much like the first century textile finds. We have these... The gamble to use ground-penetrating radar is paying off. Showed where the next floor down is. Simple as that. It's huge boulder piles all over. Where would we start? Uh, if, um, if some roof has collapsed since then. And the GPR did what Yaudin would have dreamed of doing, or Aharoni could only fantasize about. It would be science fiction for them. Earlier, the GPR also five. paves the way for the second part of Freund and Arab's non-invasive approach. And that's okay, one, two, three, four, five. Five, five sites, okay. and you have one up on the wall. I have two, I have two up on the wall. Two up on okay. the wall. So seven sites we have yeah. now. Seven sites to try out the endoscope. It's not by definition an archeological tool. It's a sophisticated and delicate piece of medical equipment used for seeing inside the body. In this context, it probes the crevices of the cave. Okay, now we're down to 80 centimeters this time. Yeah, I think so. Up to 90. Yeah, it does look like... I'm going to try this here. Just keep going. See what you can do. It's still going down. Okay, this is good. The idea of using the endoscope for this unconventional purpose came to Dr. Freund during a physical exam, common for men when they reach the middle years. He proposed the idea to Nebraska physician Gordon Moshman. Dr. Moshman, an amateur climber, was up for the challenge. Well, the uh, GPR has picked out areas which were more likely to um, uh, give us something to look at, that, that is not pure dense rock or that, there's a, that there is a cavity under, uh, underneath this stuff. And then by moving some rocks around or finding a, a, a hole or a crevice, I can pass the scope in there and then enter the cavity. Okay, I'll sneak around in. Yeah. Now, it's fully extended, so... Okay, so what, that means we're about six feet down? That means we're six feet down, six feet under. Huh? This is where we expect to find skeletons, we're six feet under here. These rocks are, are dropped in, in such a way as that there's cavities in there. So I'm able to explore the cavity, at least optically, uh, and then... Uh, um, uh, uh, with a camera, then uh, take pictures. Okay, now, okay, now we're going. That's great. Okay, hey, <laughs> it's like a little snake. Okay, this is great. Now, do you see anything around? You're in the right in the middle of a, a big hollow spot. 
underneath this big boulder. And if you can do like a hundred degree turns on it down there, you can see the whole surface of the ground. Underneath. In just a few days, the endoscope produces a lot of excitement. It's like glass beads or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Glass bead. You know how many glass beads we get in that side, huh? Every okay. day. Uh, okay, that's a little bit different. Bedouins and uh, no medieval Roman. Yes, it's a glass something. It's wire. Maybe a ring or something. It's not bead, it's ring. Yeah, it is a... Yeah. Very nice. How far down it is? One meter down. Uh, but it's at an angle. One meter. Yes, yeah. It's, it's a string and something thing. shiny. Can you get it deeper? Okay, just a minute. No deeper here, but the endoscope does demonstrate, even in a few probes, there are artifacts below the sea of boulders. They should be at 27. One of the less technical but no less important tasks of this venture involves more than Hall B. Dr. Philip Reeder remaps the cave. He sets up stations, surveying from station to station, measuring the differences in direction and changes in elevation. All the while, Dr. Reeder sketches the visual details. It's worth the work. As of yesterday, we had surveyed 177 meters, and in Yadin's map, he said that the cave was only 150 meters long. And we estimate we probably have at least 75 to 100 more meters of survey to do. So we're probably going to double the length of the cave uh, because his survey was very generalized. So much to do in the cave in so little time just five days. The crew departs with a real sense of accomplishment. Physical evidence of Bar Kokhba's rebels and how they lived in the cave is very rewarding. The things you can see, touch, feel. But the team takes away much more than artifacts. The first official excavation of the Cave of Letters in nearly 40 years is over. But the work is far from finished. The fall of 1999 brings Dr. Spreund and Arav and the others on the Cave of Letters team back to their respective campuses. There's much information from their landmark trip to Israel to digest, document, and disseminate. But in the end, can they show their visit was worth the effort? Dr. Reeder, with the help of a graduate student, creates new mapping. It replaces Yigal Yadin's long-standing map of record for future excavations. Okay, and then moving through chamber A, through this crawlway, then into chamber B. And in chamber B, um, this is the area that we called the hearth excavation, um, where uh, most of the finds were made. Data gathered on the trip takes many new shapes. One of those will ultimately transport people to the desert and to the Cave of Letters. This is the uh, preliminary model of the Nahal Ver Canyon. It's a fly-through. So basically we're flying up the canyon and we just flew past the Cave of Letters. We're working on that to, uh, with the assumption that, well, most people are not going to ever be able to go to the Cave of Letters. So this is a way to let people experience what the Cave of Letters is like because it's such a place of uh, great uh, historical significance. When the job's done, a pair of special glasses will take anyone on a virtual reality tour of this historic cave. I mean, we can rotate the cave and bring the cave in all kind of, of, uh, uh, in, uh, all, all kind of uh, perspectives and all kind of angles that, that are totally new and different to us, uh, something that years ago nobody uh, thought even about these opportunities. Other computers and software are put to work, depicting complex data from the ground-penetrating radar. And then what we'll do here is we'll start cutting the cube away, and so we can start looking Harry inside. Joel has configured it in various forms to best illustrate layers and pockets for more visits to the cave. See here, we've cut away part of this cube here. And this cube has been cut away down to the layer, the, the Bakufa layer that we've interpreted. And this, what this allowed is, as people were excavating or, or potentially excavating in the future, 
uh, we could direct that excavation and tell them where that layer would dip down or where it would come closer to the surface and hopefully direct some of the more detailed excavations of that site. While these depictions may prove useful for further exploration, Joel is most gratified that during the trip to the cave, the GPR so quickly pointed to productive areas. We did find some artifacts and lifted rocks to find areas. And in other areas we picked, we actually picked up rocks and fought, found pieces of rope, uh, pieces, a lot of wood. Uh, we found, uh, and out of that, doing more detailed work, finding that, yes, this was a habitation layer. And when you get the extinctions, you're talking, most of that is quartz when you rotate it. One of Dr. Jack Schroeder's jobs is to investigate many of those artifacts found in the cave. They provide precious clues to when people occupied it and how they lived. Radiocarbon testing proves some of the wood pieces discovered date back to early 2nd century and quite possibly before. Dr. Schroeder also works with materials collected from the hearth area where debris from a clay oven was found. Dating a piece of leather Schroeder found inside could indicate the oven was built before the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132 AD. Radiocarbon date, dating is not accurate to within, usually to within a couple hundred years uh, at, this, at this point in antiquity. And yet my radiocarbon date came back calibrated at 120 AD. Now that's only 12 years off when we know they were there. Members of the Cave of Letters expedition discovered no written materials which clearly predate the Bar Kokhba era. Other finds, however, were there before the rebels took refuge. So it's possible. Temple treasures are still buried there. And some of Yadin's bronze artifacts actually were temple treasures. But what these explorers undoubtedly discovered was hope for future excavations. I think that we're pioneering a new type of, uh, of archaeology in, uh, in cave research. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's sufficient. We don't have to find the Ark of the Covenant. That's because their approach is different from that of the legendary Yadin. He never dreamed that he can do something like this. He looked at the cave as somebody who is looking at the treasury, and he goes in and he pulls out the treasure, one treasure after the other. But looking at a cave as a place where people lived for a short time or a longer time, and how did they conduct their life, and what did they bring in, what did they bring out, where from, and the whole life inside the cave, there is nothing, when you read it, there is nothing about life at the cave. Right. In a land so tied to the history of one people, any technology that helps reveal that history is a gift. For every bit of information about how people lived in the past is a link to the present. Every morning, I pray with a prayer shawl, which uh, was given to me uh, at the time of my bar mitzvah, while we were excavating, right near where we think the skeleton uh, that was identified by Baruch Safrai was. We found one piece of linen, and on the corner of the linen were fringes. So to find a, uh, something that connects you back with a, a history of Judaism that has been continuously practiced for nearly 2,000 years, affects you personally. How many more artifacts still lie buried in the cave? Will the history of the incense shovel or even some treasures of the temple be uncovered? If they are, this trip to the Cave of Letters may turn the technological key to unlocking those secrets.
Return to the Cave of Letters was made possible with major support from the Gilbert M. and Martha H. Hitchcock Foundation, the Bethsaida Excavation Project at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford.